So we'll, we'll start a class in like um, in a minute's time. So I think I've come across almost everybody in the class. And if you are meeting me for the first time, please let me know. You can move to yourself. Let me introduce myself again. Oh, I think um, Moe. Okay, Mr. Moe, my name is Akiola Emmanuel. Okay, nice meeting you, sir. Nice meeting me, sir. you. I think this is the first class we are both attending together. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay, okay. So good to have you in class. So, so far, so good. You've been, you've been well equipped, Abby. Yes, yes, yes. I'm oh, okay, that's fantastic. That's what I want to hear. So there's a difference between Thank you, you then and you up now. Of course, of course. And then we should give, we should give Masmi good a kudos, right? <laughs> For that, for that good so impact. They are doing good. Oh, okay. Of course, they are doing well. Oh, they are doing well. Oh, okay, fantastic. That is what I yes. want to hear. Thank so you. So we are covering, we're going to cover, uh, I'm going to unmute everybody now. Please kindly unmute yourself. We have two topics we'll be dealing with today. One aspect is plumbing, while the other aspect is a sewer treatment uh, plant. So I'll try to see how we can do some judgment to the plumbing and at the same time see cover some aspect of that sewer treatment plant. So I am so much believe that this is part of the challenge that we normally have with facility managers. When it's come to plumbing, it's more or less like a headache in facility management. And the, the, the other painful aspect of it is that when you don't have a good or let me say professional plumber, it becomes a major issue. And as far as factory management is concerned, either in our house or anywhere, we can't rule out plumbing. It is very, very key because there's no how you can run a facility without water. So that is why I want us to take this um, class very, very serious. Please jot as many as possible you can jot and pen down as many as possible questions you can like ask. So at the end of the slide, we'll deal with every question one by one. So let's kick start. Plumbing systems, water and sewage treatment plant maintenance. What is plumbing? Plumbing is all about fixing, installing features, installing pipes for bringing in supply liquid substance or ingredients and removing them. When you're talking about plumbing, you talk about the source, you talk about the medium, and you talk about the output. Pardon me, class, please. So you can't, you talk about the source where the liquid is coming from. Then the plumbing are more or less like the medium, or possibly, let me say, your fittings and every other thing. Those are the medium. Then at the end, the output, where actually is the output going to when you have already <clears throat> used your whatever? So, Plumbing is not only water related. And most of us will always believe that, okay, plumbing is all about joining PVC pipes together, putting gums. No, plumbing goes beyond joining of PVC pipe together. Plumbing started all the way from the era of galvanized pipe. Now we're having PVC from there, we're having PPR pipe. There are API pipe, there are stainless steel pipe. There are a lot of industrial plumbing water that involve API pipe that require what we call industrial welding. So, it is not all about joining of PVC pipes together. It goes beyond that. And plumbing has a lot of things that we needed to discuss. So when you are talking about the source, you know, it is all about trans transporting liquid from the source through a medium to the end. Your liquid could be water. It could be um, petrol. It could be uh, uh, slurry, it could, be, it could be in liquid form. So, so don't let us put our mind on water alone when we're discussing plumbing. So as far as it is liquid, it includes what we call plumbing. Now, when we are talking about the source, you know, I told you we have the supply pipe. Can I have this slide? We have the supply, which is the piping, then the feature and the drainage. 
Now, plumbing system component, water supply and distribution, sanitary drainage and disposal system, storm drainage system, plumbing features, fire protection system, fuel and gas piping system. Like I, I earlier mentioned that plumbing is not basically only on PVC fittings alone. So fuel and gas piping. So if you are in a, a facility manager in an oil, oil and gas company, you know your kind of plumbing system is not issue about PVC. It is going to be either you are dealing with galvanized pipe or you're actually dealing with uh, PPR, APR pipes or you're actually dealing with PPR pipe. When you are a fire protection uh, facility manager, your piping works are more or less like PVC, uh, your piping works are more or less like API pipe, or you talk about governance pipe. So your fittings, the name given to your fittings could be the same thing, but they are different material. When you are doing piping work, you are doing plumbing work on fuel and gas piping, piping system, you talk about elbow, you talk about, some people call it bend, you talk about uh, uh, engineering connector, you talk about uh, socket and whatever. These are all still available. It all depend on the available area where you want to use them. And these are components that are terms as fittings under plumbing system. Then plumbing cycle. You know, I told you that you have the source, You have the source, then you have the medium, which are the fittings, and you have the drainage. So plumbing cycle starts from the supply, which is the main. The main water mains or storage tank, your source could be, maybe you just take water directly from your well. That is the source. Or possibly you fetch water inside your tank. You now use piping work to take it inside your house. The tank becomes, becomes your source. Then you are talking about the distribution system. You talk about pressure pipe, then pressure piping networking, all the network system where you have to have elbow, where you have to have gauge valve, where you need to have um, control valve. Then you talk about connecting your plumbing system to the plumbing features. What are the plumbing features? You talk about your hand washing, hand wash basin, your WC, your bedroom berth, or jacuzzi, and all those stuff. Those are the uses. Then collection. The water that you use, how do you get it collected? So it's either you talk about using gravity to send your water inside the house. After you have used the water, how do you dispose the water? Because the water goes to your drainage. Then from your drainage, you start going to what we call your sewage system. Your sewage system or your safety tank and all those, whatever. From the safety tank, the safety tank can still be used in such a way that it brings about what we call sewage treatment plant. All your used water, you collected them, reprocess them, turn into a, a good water, and at the same time, it's still used for what? Drinking. So you can see the circle like that. Then water distribution system. How do you get your water? We have several sources of water in the, uh, that we use. But the major thing we use in the house or in any facilities is either you use a cold water or you use a hot water. It can either be cold water or hot water. And that's why some features in the house, you call them mixer tap, which mixes the cold and the hot water together. So, definition carries water from the source, street mean or pump to the building and to various points in the building at which water is used as what, what, cold water or as what, hot water. So, water here, we're talking about water. Water plays an important role. And that's the only thing that is far reversed to refer to as universal solvent because that's the only thing that can dissolve anything. So now, water cycle. When rain falls, the water falls on the ground. And what happens to the water? It percolates. And when it percolates, when the sun comes outside again, the same water that, already become, that has already percolated 
the ground become hot. And when it becomes hot, it's what? It started, it becomes air. The hot air looking for a colder region started rising. And when it rises, you know, the higher you go, the cooler it becomes. When it gets to the sky, it becomes cooler. And when it becomes cooler, it started forming water droplets. And that same water that goes off, still come back to the ground again. That is more or less like a cycle. It goes and comes. So, and in that process, it follows just only three processes, which is evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. So it is only when water precipitates in the air that starts forming what, what we call water droplets. So, and the means of getting water may not necessarily be only through the rain. You can have your water through what we call groundwater. The portion of the rainwater which has percolated into the air to form underground deposits called aquiva. Aquiva is a water-bearing soil formation. These are soil formation that has huge water content in them. From the spring and well, and is the principal source of water for domestic use in most rural areas. And that's the reason why you see people that are doing borehole, people that are doing well, when they are digging the way, they have not gotten to where we call a quiver. They don't stop. They still keep and still continue digging until when they get to a quiver because they know that is where they can get a huge source of storage of water. So groundwater has its own advantage and, and at the same time has its own disadvantage because it has an abundance, it's abundant in supply. It requires less treatment because of natural filtering because the, the soil composition, the soil compilations also serve as a filter. So every other uh, purity uh, dirt or purity that are coming alongside with the water has already been filtered out with what? The soil composition. But the only disadvantage of groundwater is that it has many organic matter and chemical elements which are usually require treatment. And because of that organic chemical and uh, chemical element that has already been dissolved in the water that you can not see with your naked eyes, that's the reason why most of the time when you do your bow or you do your well, you say you need to do what we call water treatment plant. And what you're actually trying to do is to remove all the dissolved chemical that is already in the water. So what are the uses of water? These are all what we come to across on a daily basis. So then the physical properties of water, surface tension, heat absorbent, capillar uh, capillarity and dissolving ability. That's why it's called universal um solvent then water problem and their correction you talk about acidity hardness and turbidity acidity you have a range of what is acceptable for a drinking water when it is a drinking water you have a range of 6.5 to 8.5 acid level so when it is below 6.5 the water becomes acidity and when it is above it is talk about alkalinity so there are one or two things that you can use, that you can do in terms of water treatment plant that you can use to correct all those problems. Then we are talking about hardness of water. That is dissolved of either magnesium or calcium or sodium in the water. And the only <clears throat> disadvantage of hardness, a, a hard water is that if you are doing a laundry business, it might be costing you more money in terms of wasting more soap. Then turbidity. So turbidity is more or less like coloration in water. So when you do your filtration or you do your reverse osmosis, you can get rid of what turbidity in your water. Then color, uh, pollution, these are all the kind of problem or that you can come across and how to correct them in water. In terms of pollution, you can use your chlorine. And that's what is called chlorination in water treatment. Then there are some other way of treating your water again. One of the way of treating your water is sedimentation because this is more or less very common in the rural area where our parents fetch water from the brook and when they got home, when they got home, they put alum inside the water. You now discover that the whole dirt in the water settled at the base. So the clean water is at the top. They sieve the clean water out and throw the sediment at the base. So sedimentation is one of the ways of what getting water treated. Then you talk about filtration. Filtration is like you have it, bed layer of sand, and gravels, and other chemical, treating chemical, whatever. So the water comes on top, and every dirt and particles that are coming alongside the water stay at the top. Why the clean water goes from the bottom then? 
Disinfection and chlorination is one of the methods of taking what we call bacteria away from water. Then also, you use chlorine as a bleaching agent at the same time in order to make your water clear. But you know that chlorination has a dosing rate. It has a dosing rate. If you don't dose adequate rate, eventually your water can be having a bitter taste. Then another way of getting water is, we've talked about digging of well the other time, then you can also talk about borehole. These are also another means of getting water. Right? This is an example of well. This is an example of well. This is an example of well. You can see this gentleman digging the well at the same time. So now, driven well. Driven a well are more or less like your bow. A still driven well point is fitted on one end of the pipe section and driven into the air. The point may be driven into the ground to a depth of up to what, 15 meter, which is more or less approximately 50 feet down. Then bow well, these are more or less like industrial. Then drill walls require more elaborate equipment depending on the geology of the site. Used for drilling oil and can reach up to 1,000 meter in depth. So when you are talking about 1,000 meter, you are talking about almost about 3,000 feet down to the earth. And this is very, very common in oil, oil rig. They go as far as up to 1,000 meter before they can have access to crude oil. So these are all example of how we can get uh, whatever. So there's no how we're going to talk about plum uh, plumbing that we're not going to talk about water. And since this is what we are actually more familiar with, so that's why we dwell much about water. Then there's no how you also talk about water that you won't talk about pump. Even if you dug well, except you are living in a rural area where you have to go to the brook. And when you are going to the brook, that one you have to fetch the water manually, carry the water back to home. But in order to relieve yourself of any unwanted stress, you start talking about pumps. When you dig your well, you still put a pump to lift the water from the well down to your storage tank. When you do borehole, you still talk about submersible pump that will lift the water from the uh, sorry, from the uh, from the borehole down to your storage tank. So whichever form of or sources of your water, you need your water, your pump. And when you are when you are connecting your pump, there's no how you won't need all plumbing fitting to add to it. So what is a pump? A pump is a device used to move fluid, such as liquid or slurry. Pump are displays a volume displaces a volume by physical or mechanical action. So your pump is designed to help you move fluid, liquid, or slurry. And that's the reason why the, there are different types of pump. There are pumps that are basically used for water alone. There are ones that are basically used for slurry alone. There are ones that are used for petrochemicals. And there are some that are used for gas. And those ones that are used for gas are the ones that are more or less like they have, they are what we call diaphragm. Instead of impeller, what they have is diaphragm. So, and what are the different types of pump? You have positive displacement pump and negative displacement pump. And under positive displacement pump, we have reciprocating pump, which is what we are all more or less familiar with. And we have reciprocating pump, we have jet pump, this is what we are more or less familiar with at all. So this is an example of centrifugal pump. So a centrifugal pump contains an impeller mounted on a rotating shaft. The rotating impeller increases the water velocity while forcing the water into the casing, thus converting the water velocity into higher pressure. So what actually giving the water pressure in the pumping machine is the impeller. And you know, your pump is more or less like combination of mechanical and electrical. So you have the mechanical side, you have the electrical side. The function of the electrical side is just only to turn the shaft. And you have the impeller attached to the shaft. So the more the pump, the electrical, whatever, turns the pump, the shaft, the faster the rotation of the impeller. So the impeller determines and it determines the name of the pump. So this is an example of your turbine pump. Most of these turbine pumps are used in oil rig. This is an example of your submersible pump. This kind of submersible pump 
is used for pumping of slurry or sewage. Pumping of slurry or sewage. This is an example of a slurry pump or sewage pump. This is completely in mass inside the sewage. So when the sewage gets filled up, it pumps the sewage out. And when the level goes down, the pump stops by itself automatically. So this is an example of jet pump or centrifugal pump. These are what we are more or less familiar with in most cases. And at times when this one sucks here, what you do is that you do what we call priming. You open it up, put water inside it, then it starts working again. So we have a lot of piston pump. They are being used for different purposes. You have some pump. Then that brings us to storage for domestic, uh, storage of water storage for domestic use. You can use underground storage, you can use service storage, and you can use overhead storage. But the most common one is the overhead storage. But when you use overhead storage, you don't need a pumping machine to get the water down home. You use what we call gravity. So you pump the water up into the storage tank. Then from the storage tank, you distribute into every part of the building. This is what we call gravity. But the only disadvantage of this one is that if you are living in a story building, let's assume you are living in a two story building, you discover that the first floor gets water faster compared to the second floor than compared to the first floor. So it is until when all the pipes in the ground floor get saturated before water will now start going to the second floor. Before water will now start, it is when the second floor gets saturated, get filled up, before water will start going to the third floor. That is the way it is. That is the only disadvantage of gravity. Well, one of the advantages of gravity is that you don't talk about pipe busting because the water is flowing with gravity. Your pipe cannot get burst. Then when you do surface storage, you need a pumping machine to take the water to your storage tank and another pumping machine to distribute the water into the whole entire building. And when you do surface, uh, surface uh, storage and you are distributing through uh, electromechanical means with your pumps, the pressure on each floor within the building is the same thing. No floor has different pressure compared to the other. Then when you do underground, you still need your surface pumping machine to lift it up to wherever you are taking it to. In that aspect, as at the same time, you have a balanced pressure in all the floor. So these are all examples of storage, your system, pneumatic water tank, your hot water tank. So then let's talk about fittings. Plumbing, you have a valve. A valve is a device that is used to control the flow of liquid, gas, or water. It is used to control the flow of liquid, gas, or water. So what is the function of a valve? Control of water system. Start or shut down a system. When you want to work, you can close the valve. So that, that's why you see at times, you have a main control valve coming into your building, as you are living in a three bedroom apartment. Then the main control valve regulate the water that comes into that apartment. Then from the main valve, you now have branches. One branch comes to your kitchen, another one goes to your toilet, another one goes to your bedroom. Then it is all done in such a way that when I need to walk inside your bedroom, I don't need to shut down the whole entire water. You can be having water inside your kitchen. And even inside that bedroom, I can shut down the water that comes to the water that you see while I still have water in the shower when I want to take my bath. So these are function of your control valves. And the control valve has several types. There are some that are control valve. You have air valve, you have gauge valve, then you have foot valve. The foot valve are the one that most of us that we have well in our house. The foot valve is what we put under the uh, pipe that takes water from the well. The two major function of the foot valve is that it prevents dirt from getting into your impeller. So it's only clean water that the pump is sucking in. Then two, it also serves as more like a non-return valve. 
it will retain water inside that pump. So each time there is always retainment of water. So the pump doesn't need to start dragging before it takes in water. So we have wedge shape or tamper disc valve. We have double disc valve. So these are all example of what this valve. This is an example of gauge valve. Some of us we must be familiar with this. These are the type that we use at home that you start turning the head until when the water finally stops. That is an example of what a gauge valve. Then we have globe valve, we have plug tight disc valve, conventional disc valve, combustion disc valve. These are all examples of valve that we can use for various purposes. Then there is another one that is also a check valve. There is angle valve, there is conduit valve, there is foot valve, mentioned foot valve before. There is safety valve. The safety valve is very common when you are dealing with pressure. Some of us that are dealing with um, boiler, if you have come across boiler before, in case, because when there is, the water is boiled to a certain temperature, or some of us that are using pressure cooker at home, there is a safety relief valve. In case you're trying to like reduce the pressure, you can lift the safety relief valve up. Once you lift it up, the, the already built steam inside that uh, pre pressure cooker goes out. So it becomes easier for you to open the pressure cooker when, so that you don't sustain injury. These are more or less dealing with anything that is having excess pressure. There is always a safety relief valve. Then we we'll talk about faucet. Faucet are more or less like your water taps. So most of the time, the most common name that we know it for is uh, taps now. So you have brass, you have galvanized, you have the elbow type, and you have the hose bead. The compression cork type is the one that you start turning the knob until when the water finally closes. Then the key cork is the one you lift it up. When you lift it up, the water comes in. When you close it down, the water stops. Then the ball faucet are more or less like the one that you use. These are more or less like the one that are very common in the fast food. You know, fast food, they try as much as possible to do away with bacteria. So when you want to wash on your hand, those ones are the ones that you can use your elbow to turn it. It turns at an angle of 45. When you turn it at an angle of 45, the water comes out. When you wash your hand, you finish. Instead of use, using your hand to close the valve again and contaminate, cont uh, contacting bacteria, you use your elbow at the same time to close it back. The host peep are the ones that we have at home. It's very, very common, most especially within our car park, that you can easily put your hose and tie it so that you can use the hose in washing your car. Those are example of what? Example of faucet. So example of tap. So let me use the most common name because some of them might not be familiar with what we call faucets. Then water distribution. Now we're coming gradually to a uh, topic of the day, water distribution. The water service pipe, water division pipe, and the necessary connecting pipe, fittings, control valves, and all apparat uh, apparatus in or adjacent to the structure of the premises. Part of water distribution, including your service pipe, your water meter, most of us that are filling in more, where you have several numbers of tenants, you meter their water usage, and you build them. You have distribution pipe or supply pipe. Your supply pipe is the main pipe. Why distribution pipe six supply from the main pipe? So at times you call it stop. Then you have riser pipe, feature branch, feature supply. Riser pipe are more or less like, let me take your borehole for an example. You have a submersible that is being immersed inside this borehole. Then the pipe that takes the water, that join the submersible, that takes the water out, out is more or less like what we call a riser pipe. Then in your house, we also have what we call a water riser pipe at the same time. A water supply pipe that extends one full story or more to convey water to branches or to a group of features. So if you're living in a, ten, let's even say a 10 story building, the main pipe that brings the water from the source where the water is coming from and other branches join it, that is the riser. So every other branch takes their supply from the riser. So even if the riser take a main control valve at the main source, each branch will still have their own 
control valve at the same time. So you can say we have cold water distribution system. You have direct or upfed or indirect. So you supply water up and you use gravity to drop it to everywhere you are going to use it. That is called damp fed or gravity system. That is an example of damp fed or gravity system. And I've told you that the pressure in each of the floor are not always the same. The pressures are different. Then we have hydro pneumatic system. Hydro pneumatic system are when you are using your surface, when you have all your tanks on the surface. So you now use your pumping machine to like transfer water up into the building. And the pressure is always the same thing all through within the entire system. So these are the advantages and disadvantages of both upfed or you are using uh, uh, hydro pneumatics or you are using overhead fed system. In the overhead, water is not affected by peak load power. Water not affected by power interruption. So time needed to replace broken parts does not affect water supply. The water disadvantage, water is subject to contaminant, high maintenance cost, occupants, valuable space, requires stronger foundation and every other thing. So you need to do, you need to construct stanchion that you are going to put the water tank. Then if you put the water tank above the building, if there are leakages, this could be affecting your building wall or your casting at the same time. So type of hot water distribution system. So we have talked about cold water, then distribution system, then this is hot water distribution system. So the off-fed and gravity return system, you, with a continuous network of pipes to provide constant circulation of water, Hot water rises on its own and does not need any pump for hot circulation from the boiler. It rises, it doesn't need any pump. Then hot water is immediately drawn from feature, drawn from the feature anytime, provided economic circulation return of unused water. So every unused water comes through the return pipe and through the return pipe, it returns back to what? To the boiler. And this kind of water can still be what reused again. This is an example of upfed and gravity return. Then downfed and gravity return. Downfed hot water rises on onto the highest point. On the upfed gravity return, the first one, the hot water rises and start feeding each of the branches. But on down fed and gravity return, water rises to the highest point of the plumbing system and travel to the gravity feature via gravity. So it rises through the main riser pipe. So it is from the main riser pipe up that the water is now being distributed into each of the features. It comes from the source, from the uh, boiler, and it goes through the riser pipe up. Then from the riser pipe, it now comes down to each of the branches through gravity. Water distribution is dependent on the expansion of hot water and what and the gravity. This is an example of another means of distributing hot water in the building. Then third, pump cycle system. On this type, you use a centrifugal pump to distribute the hot water within the building for a more efficient circulation of hot water to the upper floor level of a multi-story building so that the pressure is equal at every floor to the last floor of the building. For equal pressure distribution, you can use pump circuit system. So this brings us to sanitary waste. Now we've talked about piping. We talk about the source of getting the water, the pipe that will take the water, and what are the types of the pipe and the controls that we need. We spoke about that one then. When I start, need to start talking about a sanitary drainage system. General rules in designing the sanitary system. The pipe should take the shortest possible route to the house sewer or the terminating point of the sanitary system. When you are taking your used water out, when you are constructing your drainage system, 
your drainage system should take the shortest possible route to your sewage tank outside. Shortest possible route. Why? Because of future maintenance. Then two, control component such as clean out, traps, and vents should be located strategically so as to ensure efficient circulation. You see that in your buildings, there are something that we call manhole. These are more or less like example of clean outs. Because when your drainage system get blocked, the first place you go to is you go and check your what? Your manholes. You open it up. If it's blocked from there, you can use clear rod from there to start making some what? Getting it through. Then traps. In your kitchen, where you are washing your dishes and every other thing, under that zinc, you have something that we call bottle trap. At times, your water doesn't flow. What do you need? You open that bottle trap. If you are using the whole style, which has screw, you just unscrew it. You clean all the sediment that are already inside and clean very well, and replace it back. Your water started flowing. Then your WC has what we call ham. It looks like a ham, a bed, or like a trap at the same time. The function of the ham is that to make sure that there is a consistent water inside the WC. Then the second thing is that it also prevents backflow of odor, backflow of odor. Then three, when your WC get blocked, the first thing you do is to use your plunger to get it through. So, so system of the sanitary system, you have waste collection system and ventilation. So one is to collect the waste. And uh, which one are the one that is collecting the waste? You have what we call floor drains. These are being connected to your what? To your drains, drainage system. Then your drainage system is now being connected to your what? Sewage system outside. Then in order to avoid backflow of odor, you have what we call ventilation. That's why if you look at the back of your toilet at home, you see a pipe that rises up and has a vent on top of it so that the heat that is being generated inside the sewage uh, sewage tank is being pulled out through that means. So we have waste pipe, you have vent pipe, you have trap, you have stack, you have branches. These are all your drainage sanitary system. You have house of your normal drain, then your normal sewage system. Now I need to draw our attention to something here. Your sewage system, there is a rule that says that your sewage system should extend from the house drainage at a point of 0 0.60 meter from the outside face of the foundation. So you shouldn't locate your sewage tank close to your fence wall. Because in case the sewage kick or it collapse, because you know, so your sewage is meant because your sewage always have uh, soak away. The soak away is to soak all the water content in the sewage away. But it will get to a point that the ground becomes saturated. When the ground becomes saturated, the water goes nowhere anymore. So the building, the wall of the sewage can start collapsing. Now, when it starts collapsing, you wouldn't know. And before you know, it can get your fence wall to fall. That's why it is always better you give at least a space of almost about like close to one meter from the main foundation wall. <clears throat> then you have horizontal and horizontal to horizontal change of direction. When you are doing your plumbing, uh, your drainage system, you have horizontal to horizontal change of direction. You have vertical to horizontal change of direction. You have horizontal to vertical change of what direction. So no fitting having more than one inlet at the same level shall be used. I need to draw attention to something here. Okay, use 45 degree or 60 degree Y branch. Combination Y one by eight bend branches, sanitary tree or sanitary tap T branch or other approved fitting of equivalent sweep. Why is this is that you are moving from horizontal to vertical.
So, and you know your water needs to flow. And this is suggesting that you should use 45 degree, not direct 90 degree. So, so that it is easier when you want to do feature maintenance, you can have your K rod to go through or 60 degree or Y. It is easier. But when you take a sharp 90 degree bend, it is not easier for you to do any maintenance. The only area where you can do that is only when you have a manhole. And that one is more like horizontal to horizontal change of direction, not horizontal to what? Vertical. So when you are talking about drainage system, I need to draw our attention to this area angle very well. If you are supervising projects as a facility manager, you need to pay a very key attention to this when they are running your drainage system. Your drainage system should maintain a minimum slope, most especially horizontal drainage pipe. It must maintain at least two percent bend, and that's why you see when this is not being maintained, you see that you are having water being retained in the drainage pipe. And when there is water retained, when your drainage pipe retains water, you can't rule out odor, either in the kitchen or within the entire facility system. You must ensure. So it must follow that gradient gradually, consistently until when it's get to the final discharge point. Then two, where it is impracticable due to the depth of the street sewer, adverse structural feature and irregular building plan, pipe of 102 diameter or larger may have a slope of not less than 1% or 100 mm. If you are using a bigger pipe, fine, you can still maintain a slope of 1%. Or one degree. But when you are using a lesser, smaller pipe, please ensure you maintain two, 20 percent or two degree slope or more than that. So that you know that as even a drop of water enter that drainage system, it goes straight to the sewage, uh, sewage tank outside. These are all examples of trap. I'm so sure we are familiar with this because this is very common at home. Then this is your example of also trap. This is the common pit trap, the one that we normally have at home in the kitchen that we can easily remove, clean whatever dirt that is there and clean the dirt and fix it back. This is your, you can see this is your WC. This is the R. This is the last thing I was talking about that your WC is provided with a hair in order to ensure there is no backflow of odor and also at the same time retain water. Use for features such as slop sink that are usually built low in the ground, leaving very little space for foundation and what and trap. Then this type used within the line of house, house drain in order to prevent backflow of what odor. This is a drum tap. These are all examples of tap. So let's talk about clean out. At the upper terminal of every horizontal sewage or waistline, there must be a clean out. So most of the time, we call it um, manhole. Then at each run of piping more than 50 meter, when you run a drainage pipe that is more than 50 meter, there must be a clean out within that length. So you could just don't run your drainage pipe for like almost about 30 meter, 40 meter, 50 meter without a manhole. There must be. Even there are some situations that you reduce it to maybe like even 10, 10 meter. At every 10 meter interval or 50 meter interval, you put what? A manhole so that it is easier for you to do clean out at any time that is possible. At every 50 meter of a total developed length, or a fraction thereof. Additional clean out shall be provided on a horizontal line with an aggregate offset angle exceeding 135 degree. And that's why you see most of the clean out, when you see a pipe coming in, another one is going out. And when you want to take another bend, 
if you calculate the angle between the incoming clean out in, incoming um sewage pipe and the out and the other outgoing they don't work at an angle of maybe 90 as at an angle of what 135 degrees so that it's easier for you to use a k-rod to do what we call trim when you have issue with blockage inside the building near the connection between the building and the drain drain and the building's sewage or installed outside the building at the lower end of the building drainage and extend to what to grid. So there must be a clean out between the building and your uh, sewage system. So that whatsoever that is coming from the building, you don't do directly direct to your sewage system. You must put a clean out in, in between. Now you, so you have to unmount your service. Uh, I'm hearing the noise at the background. Please unmount yourself, please. Okay. So these are area where clean out is not required. On a horizontal uh, drain that is less than 1.5 meter length, you don't need a clean out. On a short horizontal drainage pipe installed at a slope of 72 degrees, you don't need a clean out. So you are good to go in those area. So let's talk briefly on ventilation. Why you need portion of the drainage pipe installation intended to maintain balanced atmospheric pressure inside the system. So when you don't maintain a balance between the atmospheric pressure and the entire system, there could be what we call backflow of odor. So there is always what we call vent pipe, a pipe or opening used for ensuring the circulation of air in the plumbing system and for relieving the negative pressure exerted on the trap or so. So if you don't put all those things in play, that could be what? Backflow of air or uh, odor that will be backflow of pressure at the same time within the entire building. And that's why you see that in your, in your, in your overhead tank, when the supply pipe that brings in, that brings in the water into the tank comes in, at the other end where you have your discharge going out, there is another pipe that rises up. The function of that pipe is to ensure there is what we call balance of air, balance of pressure between the pressure within the pipe and atmospheric pressure. So, and if you don't put that in place, you can experience what we call air lock within the system. There'll be water inside your tank, but the water will not get inside. That, those are the words they put those, uh, the reason why they use those words. These are example of vents. So in your house, if you have a multi-story building, there is a vent that goes from the main building that rises from the floor to the last floor on the on the main up to the rooftop of the last story of the last story. And this pipe could be of maybe 100 mm, it could be two inches pipe, it could be three inches, pipe, it could be four inches pipe. It all depends. There are some times that this pipe also serve another purpose. This pipe can be used as a dry pipe, which is meant for the charging of air. Then it can also be used as a drill, as a waste pipe to convert, you, you, you join all your roof gutter completely together and passes it through that pipe. So most of the time it is called wet pipe. Fine, it's a, it's a vent pipe which is meant for balancing of atmospheric pressure and the entire pressure in the system. But at the same time, because it's, of no, it's, it's serving only, only any other, instead of it to be there, serving only the purpose of the charging air alone, at times you convey all your root gutter to it and still use it to serve as a root gutter to convey wastewater out of the building. So this is the main vent. This is an example of main soil and waste vent. This is what I call wet vent. Because this one performs two uh, options. It takes water waste from the building and at the same time it's used as what? It's used as the charging of what? Air in the building. Continue to the roof. The portion penetrating to the roof is called the vent stack through roof. Then you have main vent. This is at times called collecting vent line serve as support to the main soil and wet waste vent. So 
it is being connected. It serves more or less like a branch to the main one. So it takes all the air from each of the branches to and convert, connect them back to the main vent. You can see from this diagram. Okay. You can see from this diagram, this is the main vent. And this is the stack vent that is being joined to it. So you can see this take the air from this WC, from this WC and from this WC and join into the main stack. So this stack take the air and the charges outside. So this is individual vent or back vent. You can find this at the back of your hand wash and once uh, zinc, then this is most time, this is the main vent. These are all your dual vent. Joining this urinary and this urinary together and connect it to the main vent outside. These are all another relief or stack vent. Yoke or bypass is another type of vent. This is another type of vent, which is circular circuit vent or loop vent. I've spoken about this wet vent, local vent, dry vent, stack vent, vent stack. These are all vents. Where are vents required? Let's dig a bit down. Each trap shall be protected against siphonage and back pressure through what venting. So, and each place is where you have what trap. There must be a vent, one to prevent back pressure, back flow of pressure, and to prevent back flow of odor. Then the area where you don't need vent are on a primary settling tank interceptor, which discharge through a horizontal indirect waste pipe into the secondary interceptor. So we don't need a vent there. Two, trap serving zinc in an island bar counter. We don't need a vent, uh, a, a vent in that place. So these are all. You need to. Okay. This is an example of your flood drain. And at the same time, if you are living, if you have a facility that is being situated in a slopey area, and you know that when erosion falls, the whole of the facility got flooded, you can construct what we call a sewage. So the water goes inside that sewage through your flood drains, and it's stuck inside that sewage. Then you now use your normal sewage pump to pump the water outside after the rain. So this roof gutter, you get your roof gutter to take all the water from the entire roof to your, to your sewage tank. And this is where you can still use your vent that I told you that you can use your vent can serve as a dry vent and as a wet vent. So in a situation whereby you link your roof gutter with the dry vent, it becomes a wet vent. So we're going to have like 10 minute break so we'll come back when we come back we're going to deal completely with distillation this water treatment system so after water treatment system we go back to sewage treatment so i'm giving us just 10 minutes so after 10 minutes we come back this is 504, they will come back by 514. Thanks.
Yeah. We're back from the short break. How many cup of tea have we taken? Please, kindly, kindly signify if you can hear me, please. I want to confirm you can hear me very well. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. So let's go back to, we're dealing with water treatment system now. And I'm so sure a lot of people will have a lot of questions because plumbing, water treatment system has always been posing challenge in facility management. So, so let's, distillation. I know we are more, some of us that are science students, I know we are familiar with what we call distillation in chemistry. So the process of removing water from its contaminant. So it involves conver converting water into vapor state by eating the water. After you heat the water, you cool it, you condense the water back into its former liquid state. So that takes all the contaminants away. But the bottom line is that the money you're going to spend in doing this kind of treatment is even each compared to the amount of water you eventually get back from that, uh, that kind of a system. So it is not, this can only be used when you are dealing with industrial and you have an excess supply of power that you can use. Possibly maybe you're a power generating the company that you have excess supply of power. So you can do what we call distillation and generate your water, your water from there instead of buying water or drilling whatever. Then water purification. So you, water has three chemicals, or let me say four. You have the physical properties of water, you have the biological properties of water, and you have chemical properties of water. When you are treating your water, you are dealing with each of these three aspects, physical, biological, and chemical. And in terms of physical, we talk about your water has to be colorless, odorless, and what? And tasteless. And biological is when you start talking about microbia in your water, you talk about E. coli, you talk about sodium, and chemical aspect of it, you talk about the soft solid like um, calcium, sodium, and uh, iron, lead, zinc these are all chemical that can be dissolved in your water so chemical processes include chlorination using of ultraviolet light and flocculation ultraviolet light means ultraviolet light means you are sterilizing the water because of bacteria then biological processes of biological active carbons and slow sand filter physical include sedimentation filtration and what distillation these are all three process of what? Treating your water. Then water purification. Removal of contaminant from untreated water. Substances removed during the process of purifying are algae, viruses, bacteria, manganese, suspended solid, iron, and sulfur, other chemical pollutants. The goal of water purification is to produce water that is fit for a what? Specific what? Purpose. <clears throat> Then reverse osmosis. I know few of us are familiar with this. Reverse osmosis, you know, in biology that time, we're being told that osmosis is the movement of water from lower concentration to higher concentration through a semi-permeable membrane. So now reverse osmosis is the reverse of the normal osmotic pressure. So you are moving from higher concentration in terms of reverse osmosis to a lower concentration through a semi-permeable membrane. So, and the major thing that is doing the work in your reverse osmosis is what we call membrane. And that membrane, you have the permit side and the waste side. So the permit side is the original water and the waste side is the water that is not useful. And that is the reason why in reverse osmosis, you have what we call recovery rate. So your recovery is between 50 to 75 recovery. So that means the water, the machine takes in 100% of water it yield 75% of clean water, um, return 25% of what? Bad water as what? As weight or con concentration. So if we have filtration, the process of passing water through a water system that has one or more filter. One, filtration removes, removes what taste, it removes color, it removes odor, it removes turbidity and what? Iron. Then ultraviolet, this is use of sunlight to kill microorganisms. So there are some microorganisms that can survive or some bacteria, some biological, whatever that can survive 
all your filtration and whatever, but they may not be able to survive what you call travalent light. So three step water purification component. You have sediment filter, remove majority of larger particle matter from the water. Then you have kinetic degradation flux uh, ion filter. Chlorine is taken out of water and converted into what? Chloride. Then you have activated carbon filters, attract positively charged contaminants and they stick to the water, to the filter. So water treatment plant installation. So determine water quality. Before you install water treatment plants, I always tell people that a single water treatment cannot resolve all water problems. No. Every water has its own peculiar problem, and there are ways of dealing with each of those problems. So the first thing you need to do is take a sample of your raw bottle to any approved chemical laboratory and do what we call water analysis. Knowing the water quality is a major key in installing a water treatment plant. It determines the application of water treatment. Water with a higher quality will require minimal treatment. So when the quality of the water is okay, you might not need major treatment. But the result of your analysis will tell you the problem that is with the water and how to go by it. Selection of water treatment system. One, you need to consider the following. Are there any hard water issue? What is the water quality needed? Water treatment system capability. Because it's not a situation whereby they need like 10,000 10, liters of water per day or 30,000 liters of water per day. And you now design a system that can only treat just only 5,000 liters of water per day. So you need to know what is the volume of water that they will be using. So that will determine the kind of filtration, the size of the filtration filter you're going to use and the size of the pumping machine that that filtration filter will need. Provision of good water quality, the treated water reduces ash effects on skin. The treated water does not damage laundry. So these are what you need to like what consider. Then water treatment process. One, coagulation. Coagulation is involved, involved adding alum, addition of alum or polymer to the water. What alum does is that it allows the water to coagulate. And when the water coagulates, the all the coagulated water become heavier than the normal water. So it settles at the bottom, while the normal water stays at the, bottom, at, the, at, the, at the top. Then tiny fine particle of dirt in the water sticks together. That is what they mean by what coagulation. Then flocculation. Coagulated raw water is gently mixed by large mechanical powders. Causes the fine light particle to mature into larger, denser, and heavier particle called flux. Flux is produced by removal of ion through aeration or chlorination. The flocculant will then be removed by what? Filtration. So that is what flocculation does. You still use alum for your what? flocculation. And when you, flo when you flocculate, the flux from what you call, they move like a particles. So when they move like a particle, you remove them and the flocculant will be removed by what? By filtration. So the remaining one is passed through what? Filtration. So all the other flocculant are being removed by what? By your filtration. Then sedimentation, <clears throat> which I've already earlier explained on that one we're dealing with plumbing. Flocculated water moves slowly into the sediment basin. The heavy dense particles settle at the bottom of the basin. The settled particle forms sludge on the bottom of the sedimentation basin. Sludge is periodically removed from the basin. Disinfection. A very effective disinfectant is what? Chlorine. You disinfect your water with chlorine. So chlorine is added after clarified water leaves the certain basin. Chlorine helps to guard against any possible contaminant in the water, in the water distribution system. So your chlorine 
chemical is also the disinfection. So there are several numbers of chemicals that are being used in water treatment plant. You have your chlorine, you have your alum, you have your lime, you have your soda ash, uh, you have, um, I think these are the four most common use currently, apart from when you are dealing with some other industrial, but most common one are those four. But the water quality will determine which one you are going to use out of them. pH adjustment. Filter water pH is adjusted by adding lime. So you can adjust your pH by addition of lime or by addition of soda ash. Lime achieve the sub pH target. Lime helps to stabilize the natural soft water. Lime reduce corrosion in the distribution system. Adjusting the pH make the water more basic and less corrosive to pipes. Extend the life of the disinfectant residual. So you see the importance of your pH in water treatment. So your pH should be within the range of 6.5 to um, 8.5. And when the pH is low, you use lime to like adjust the pH or you do what we call comprehensive backwashing at times. Filtration. Filtration is removal of particle in the water through filter. The filter is made up of layers of gravel, sand, crushed atracite, or calcite. The suspended impurity in water are collected by filtration. Water is passed through a filter at a control rate. The filter are regularly cleaned by what? By portion. So there are some facilities that the only thing we do is that the first day the water has been, uh, the uh, project has been commissioned. Since that day, there's nothing that is called backwashing. We don't do backwashing on constant basis and whatever. But most of the time we complain that the quality of the water is not good. Most especially when you have iron in your water, you see that the water become damaged. So if you have iron in water, if area where they don't have iron is doing backwashing once in two days, you know you, that you are having iron, that's mine. You that you are having iron, you have to be doing your backwashing on a daily basis, even at times, twice daily, which is very, very key because you need to get rid of what we call um, the trapped particles in the, in the filtration media. Fluoridation. Water is treated with fluorosilicate acid when the water leaves the secondary settling basin. So your flora is more or less like your chlorine at the same time because it's also, they are, it's also from the family of what? Uh, chloride. The fluor fluorosilicate acid adds fluoride to the drinking water to aid in dental cavity what? prevention. Maintenance of water treatment plant. You have daily, you have monthly, you have quarterly, you have biannual, and you have annual maintenance. On daily basis, Dosing of applying dosing of chemical backwash of the filter vessels, check the function of the filtration pump, dosing pump, and sera, transfer pump, check the pH and TDS, pH, chlorine, and TDS level. TDS means total dissolved solid. There is a meter that you can easily get. It's called TDS meter. That tells you what is the total dissolved solid in your, your water. There are seven today total dissolved solid according to Nigeria. Uh, World Health Organization and uh, NAVDAC is the approved range is 500 ppm. Your TDS is measured in ppm. Ppm means part per million. So when you have a TDS that is higher than 500, that means the total dissolved solid in that water is each. And WHO mentioned that any water beyond that is not safe for what, drinking. Then you have monthly maintenance, which is washing of the dosing tank servicing of the chemical dosing equipment, servicing of filtration and transfer pump, laboratory analysis of the water, then quarterly maintenance. But most of the time, I always suggest six month analysis, except you are in a facility whereby the main core of that facility is water treatment. Maybe they are selling water. So you have to be doing your analysis on a monthly basis. But if you are running a facility that you only supply water for sanitary purpose or whatever. So you can run your analysis every six months. Quarterly maintenance, washing of aeration tank and water storage tank, replacement of filter media. Then by annual, carry out overhaul of the pumps, replace seal, impeller, valves, and kits. 
carry out overhaul of the filter vessel, tighten bolts and nuts, replace weak ones, annual maintenance, servicing of the borehole. Some of these tasks are automated in modern water treatment plants, but trained personnel are still required to control and maintain them. These are the kind of maintenance you carry out on your water treatment plant. General indicator of water quality. pH, I've mentioned it. You have 6.5 to P to 8.5. Water will have a soda taste or slippery feel at high pH, metallic tasting, pitting of features, and piping pipes is an indication of low pH because your acid will erode your pipes. Then turbidity, less than five is acceptable. So you have clarity of sample indicate water contamination. Then chlorine, one to 0 0.2 parts per million is okay. Then total dissolved solid, you have 500 milligram per liter. ITDS indicate water hardness, stain, bitter or salty taste. So your TDS must not go beyond 500. Copper, 1.3 milligram per liter. Bitter metallic taste, blue green stain on plumbing feature. Manganese, when you have manganese, uh, when you have manganese dissolved in water, acceptable limit is 0 0.05 milligram per liter. Bitter taste, black stain on laundry and features. Chlorine, the acceptable limit is 250 milligram per liter. Your sulfate, acceptable limit is 250 milligram per liter. Ion, 0 0.3 milligram per liter. So. You have yellow stain, this color beverages, stain laundry, metallic taste. So these are all the effects of each of the um, water contamin contaminants. Water testing procedures. Physical tests to indicate water property, to indicate properties in water detectable by means of sense. So when you test your water and you see that it has a bitter taste, if you are adding more chlorine, this is possible. The properties tested for are turbidity, color, odor, and taste. Then biological test to determine the amount of organic substance and mineral that affects water quality. And what are these chemical, whatever you talk about, iron, lead, manganese, magnesium, sodium, chlorine, uh, fluoride, and all those stuff. Then bacteria, biological tests, which are bacteriological tests to confirm the amount of organic load of the soft organic compound indicate the presence of microorganisms, mainly bacteria, like E. coli, plasmodium, and all those stuff. Those are biological tests that you carry out in water. Potential hazard of water treatment. Exposure to hazard substances like chemical because your chlorine could be very choking if you are trying to like take chlorine. So it is always advisable you cover your nose very well when you are when you want to deal with chlorine. Trips or fall exposure to high level of noise. Exposure to toxic substance, electric shock, fire hazard, and suffocation. These are potential hazards that are associated with water treatment plants. What can you do to prevent them? Safety holes, safety shoes with non skid sole should be worn. Use appropriate ear protection. Properly guard all equipment moving parts. Use M MSDS. Check air quality of the confined space. Thoroughly check all electrical equipment. Use respirator and gas mask, wear coverall, wear hand glove. These are all preventive measures you can use when dealing with it. Water treatment components include aeration tank. Aeration is a process whereby you allow the water to have an, a mixture, uh, you, you, you allow the water to have a contact with the air. That is aeration. And the reason why is that if the aquifer where the water is being taken lacks what we call oxygen, you have the tendency that your water may be smelling, which is very, very common on the island. So the best thing is for you to first of all aerate your water. You bring the water to be in close contact with the air. Use of. aeration tank is used for the removal of hydrogen sulfide, rotting excrement, and ion from water. Here is introduced into the aeration system to treat hydrogen sulfide and ion. It has a vent system that releases hydrogen sulfide gas to the atmosphere, provide a turnover of air in the tank. Filter vessel. Used in the final stage of the water treatment process, remove remaining 
suspended particles as unsettled flock in the water used for backwashing filter vessel media what are the filter vessel media you have activated carbon filter rapid stand filter pressure filter so these are all these are an example a picture of filter vessel it is being installed at the final stage of the after all treatment has been done this is more or less like final purification of the water dosing pumps used for feeding chemical in in small quantity into water undergoing the treatment process. So this is more or less done, most especially if you have a dosing tank. You dose your chemical into the aeration tank. So from the aeration tank to go to the filtration tank so that your aeration, your foot filter also help you to remove some of these chemicals that you've already dosed. What I require chemical dosing in order to control the chlorine level, the pH balance, any other water quality criteria. These are pictures of your dosing pumps. Then steerers. These are a picture of steerers. A mechanical device used for steering chemical added to the dosing tank. Your chlorine is an example of incomplete dissolved solid in water. As time goes on, it settles at the base of the dosing tank. That's the reason why it is always advisable when you are using chlorine as a dosing agent in water treatment, you should have a steerer that keeps steering it so that the chemical doesn't start settles under your chlorine settles. Then alum, if alum is lived for like five, six days in its tank, it's also settles at the center, but it doesn't settle faster compared to chlorine. So because your alum is more or less like a complete dissolved in water. So a mechanical device used for steering chemical added in the dosing storage tank used for flocculation to create the desired flow condition used to flocculate the particle in the water ensure the rapid mixing of the chemical help to avoid the chemical settling at the bottom of the tank which i earlier mentioned so these are all example of serum transfer pumps we deal with pump when we're dealing with uh, uh plumbing pump used to transfer treated water to the water storage tank its primary function is to provide more water from one location to another. So we've discussed a lot about pump. The pressure difference is what draw the water in and transfer the water as the pressure changes again. So this brings us to the end of water treatment plan. So this time around, I'm just going to give us five minute break. Then when we come back, we start sewage treatment plant. Five minute break. This is just um, five thirty-five. So we come back for five source from the well. Then the features through the connection of pipe, our toilet, our bedroom, and every other thing. Then the drainage convey the water. Where does the water go? It goes to the sewage tank. Then from the sewage tank, somebody comes to evacuate. Where is being is it being discharged? We have a lot of sewage treatment plants in Lagos State, and we have discharge points. Like some country that doesn't have access to water, like the way we have it in let me put it in Nigeria. What they actually depend on is sewage treatment plant. They take their sewage, they treat the sewage, and now send the water to a treatment plant for further treatment before it becomes a very good drinking water. And that's why it is. It has become a more or less like a law in Lagos State. It is legal. Once your building is going beyond a, a story building, you must have a sewage tank erect in that building. Otherwise, if Lagos State try to find out, they can penalize you, and it's it's illegal. So introduction. Also, ask for liquid waste from bath, toilet, kitchen liquid waste from industry. These are what? Sewage. It could be industrial sewage, it could be domestic sewage, but you know that industrial is going to be in large scale compared to domestic. Then, sewage process. Oil and grease trap, the first thing is that you collect the sewage, you remove the caked oil and grease and all the other contaminants like bottle, cloth, nylon, and every other thing. 
Then from there, it goes to the screen chamber, equalizer tank, it goes to the aeration tank. I've mentioned aeration tank to remove odor, settling tank. From there, you determine the condition and the watering system. <clears throat> then clarified water, some sand filter, activated carbon filter, treated water tank, then from there, water sauna and combination. These are the process used in what? In sewage. From this, after this activated carbon, you can either decide to flush the sewage to the public drain or you send it for treatment for the use of maybe flushing of toilet, wetting of garden, or washing of cars and every other thing. Or you can still send it to a reverse osmosis to be further processed for drinking. So it's all dependent. So pre-treatment in a sewage treatment plant, the pre-treatment starts from removal of all raw sewage. And those materials include your trash, your stick, your rag, your can, leaf branches, and every other thing. You can talk about lylon, your bottle water, your pure water lylon. Pre-treatment is carried out with one mechanically automated bar screen for large population, manual screen for small population. If it is a smaller population that okay, is a domestic type, you can use your manual screen. Somebody can, two people can gather, hold the screen, then you start pouring the water, then it takes all the setting, all the, all the rags and all these um, unwanted materials away. So bar screen optimizes the removal of solid. If the solids are not properly removed, the solid will become trapped in the pipe and the plant moving part and ends causing inefficiency in the treatment process. So if you are dealing with industrial, when you do your treatment and you've removed all these unwanted joints, you water goes through the next stage, through pipes. But if all these are not properly removed, you start having them blocking your pipes. Can imagine when you have a whole lot of bottled water blocking the drain, uh, the, the pipes that convey the sewage water. Then, part of this treatment stage is removal of grits, adjusting incoming sewage velocity after you have removed all those whatever, allow sand, stone, grit sediment. So because the sand, the stone, and all those ones are heavy. They said to remove out of large objects like napping, sanitary to wear, face wipe, cutting board, and all those ones. After the removal of those ones, you remove the fat and grease with schema or air blower. The schema is more or less like you know this big spoon that these people that are selling akara that they use to remove akara from the uh, oat oil or to remove the crumbs of that akara from the oat oil. That is how a smith schema look like. So you use that one to remove the oil, the fat and the grease on top of the water, sewage. Then equalizing the flow. Equalizing the flow means provide variable discharge control, bypass and cleaning. Use what we call aerator, which I've already mentioned earlier on. These are equalizing stage. And these are part of pre-treatment stage in sewage treatment plant. Then, Primary treatment and secondary treatment. These are all part of what pre-treatment. Pre sewage is air temporary in a quiescent tool. The primary treatment is like, after you have done all the necessary equalizing and whatever, you allow the sewage water to remain in a container for a large or for a long period of time. It'd be like an hour or two hours, three hours or four hours, it all depends. What you are trying to do is that, one, you are trying to enable every solid to settle at the base of the basin. Then, some solids will float, like oil and grease. Then, you'll be able to remove all the floating material and the settled material. Then, the, the charge, when you have removed the floating and the settling material, the main sewage water, that is free of all this oil, grease, or whatever, now goes out of the basin, and it is now meant for secondary treatment. 
And during the secondary treatment, you remove suspended and biological matters. Then you separate the microorganism from the treated water. Break down of small and invisible nasty bugs. Nasty bugs are all those flies that, like your normal house fly, you know, because of the odor of the sewage. So you move all those nasty snacks, then eating of bugs by bacteria. So you remove every of those one during the secondary treatment. So after the secondary treatment, then you now have what we call fixed film or attached growth system. So you are treating the water further. And during this stage, you allow the sewage to pass over a media. And in that passing of the media, it removes high level of all the organic matter that comes alongside with it because the kind of film you're using has a finer, a finer, finer pore holes compared to the other one on the primary and the secondary. Then suspended growth system, mix of biomass with sewage, that is biogas. You are mixing them with the sewage. Operation of the biomass in a smaller space. After you have done that, you now move to what we call tertiary treatment. And what do you do in tertiary treatment? Removal of, like, removal of rejection of very fragile or sensitive ecosystem. Then disinfection of already treated water prior to the child to lagoon. This is more or less like the final stage in terms of so, sewage treatment. Because it is at this point, before you even discharge to the lagoon, you still have to do what we call sewage analysis. You take a sample of the water to the lab and analyze it to ensure that the when you discharge to the lagoon, it has laser or no effect on aquatic living. Because this has become illegal, even currently now in Lagos. You can't discharge. You must provide your analysis of your final treatment before you can be charged into the lagoon. And it's a jailable offense if you try it. But you can try it without being caught. But when you are caught, I'm so sure legal state try as much as possible to make skin good of some a lot of people that they are able to like lay their hand on. So the final slot treatment. All the slot that you have removed, you have discharged your water into the lagoon. But remember that when you remove your unwatered material, you have sludge that set you at the base, at the bottom of the basin. The remover, the removed sludge can also be treated. Then when you treat that remover, the sludge, you can now dispose the generator sludge. You can just discharge the sludge into the, into any lagoon or whatever. You still have to like, make sure you treat the sludge before discharging. Treatment reduce amount of what? Bacroorganism. Then in, if you have the sludge in an industrial scale, you can use it to generate electricity. So because what you get from that one is called biogas or biofuel. So thermal destruction, burning and drying sludge to generate it. It is turned into electricity. Gas to grid, use of slot to create biogas. Biogas can be used to power building. Combine heat and power. Application of anaerobic detection to the, treat the sludge. Sludge is used to create biogas. Biogas creates electricity after being bought. But this is only advisable when you have your sludge in a huge and in a large amount. Not all these domestic one we're having. It's more or less like you are wasting money if you are trying it. Pumping and aeration control. Nitrogen removed through aeration control. Nitrogen is being removed because nitrogen is one of the things that causes odor in sewage. Then aeration period commences after a new load is pumping is pumped in. So once that one is being discharged out, another one is being pumped in, and it's followed the same process again. So as soon as you pump in into the uh, sewage tank, it's aeration start because sewage tank is not being covered because you have a screen that takes all the unwatered material away. So it's giving the sewage water opportunity to have an exchange and mix with the air. So aeration takes effects from that point. Then pump required for treatment process. 
you don't use the type of pump that you use for normal water for this one because this one is more or less like sludge or slurry. So, but that are dedicated are design pump that are made for this kind of what this kind of purpose. So you have shredder pump to pump treated sewage to the process tank. The second stage pump pump treated water out of the sewage pump uh, plant. The third pump used to automatically remove sludge from the process tank. So you have three set of pump. One to pump pre-treated sewage to the process tank where it is being processed. And in the process tank, that is where you have the primary, the secondary, the tertiary treated. It's after the tertiary, you can now pump to the lagoon. The second stage is the pump to pump the treated water out of the sewage water plant to the public drain. Then the third pump is used to automatically remove the sludge that has already settled in the basin to the process tank for what, before you treat the, uh, the sludge and discharge. Sludge removal. Sludge is removed after sludge set to set, settlement is there. You know, I told you, you conduct the treated sewage before you discharge. Then the sewage, after you treat uh, the sludge, after you treat the sludge, you still have to conduct tests and ensure it is safe for aquatic living before you discharge it at the same time. What is sludge settlement tank uh, test? Measure of sludge quantity in the tank compartment. Inspection of sludge settlement properties. So what are those properties? You talk about pH, you talk of, about BOT, turbidity, and equally. This is biological aspect of it. So these are what you need to test. And it is quantity when this one are being certified by NAVDAC approved laboratory before you can discharge your sludge into the public drain. So type of sewage treatment system, you have activated sludge process system, you have rotating biological contactor system, these are types. You have submerged aerated filter sewage treatment plant, you have suspended media filter sewage treatment plant, you have sequencing patch reactor sewage treatment plant. The maintenance of sewage treatment plant require either quarterly, biannually, or annual maintenance. Maintenance ensures plant function efficiently. Maintenance prevents plants from becoming a pollution or hazard. So each of these process has their whatever. So the first analysis you conduct on your uh, sewage will determine which of these process you are going to put in place, either activated sludge process or rotating biological contactor. In activated sludge process, this plant recycles waste products with bacteria that are alive, bacteria that are settled to the digestion chamber. This speed up and activate the raw sewage digestion. So this is advantage of this. Then the biological rotating contactor system require either quarterly, biannually, or annual maintenance. Maintenance ensures optimal performance of the what mechanical part and what internal moving part. So those are examples of the sewage treatment plan that you can love, employ in treating your what? In treating your sewage. Extended, uh, extended aeration sewage treatment plant. So these are an example of your aeration tank seen in this diagram. Extend, digest solid and liquid waste in the central compartment. Sewage is aerated for a longer period. Plant is maintained by annually. Sludge is removed between the period of one to two years, does not work well when overloaded. Work between work better when reasonably was loaded. Ensure more electricity. Consumes more electricity. So this is another sewage treatment plant option. But the only advantage of this is that it takes more electricity. So that could be giving you SSB. Filter sewage treatment plant. This is another example of sewage treatment plant. This one needs only an annual maintenance. It does not require electricity for the process. So this is an example of it. So bathroom, laundry, WC, all of them comes into the coarse sand. So the coarse sand takes care of every sediment and brings it down to the, to the world sand filter that was with that is filled with what read 
So from here, the normal water goes out of the bottom. There's a, there's a pumping machine that pumps it out. So the waste from here goes out. Then you have reed bed sewage treatment plant. Plant is either in vertical and horizontal bed. Vertical bed treats sewage better than horizontal bed. Horizontal bed sometimes discharge bad effluent quality. Why vertical bed run on electric pump, which are very, very expensive. Environmental implication of sewage treatment. One, odor. Population exposed to sewage sludge complain of odor. Odor indicates the presence of septic condition and anaerobic condition. That is absence of oxygen. Odor affects the quality of life of those that are consistently exposed to the sewage or sludge. These are environmental impacts of sewage treatment plant. Then, odor can be reduced by do, applying dose of chlorine, carbon reactor, calcium nitrate, hydrogen peroxide, ion salt. Effluent quality. Sewage must be adequately treated to avoid effluent emitting odor, reduce the level of POD and pathogens released into the water, reduce bacteria and organic pollutants. So these are effluent quality in sewage treatment plant. Then others are pipe corrosion, then control of pipe corrosion. So your sewage treatment can cause another environmental impact, which include pipe corrosion. So solid and liquid from sewage treatment process are very corrosive, causes damage to pumps, tanks, and pipes. So how do you control corrosion? Pipes should be made of inert material. This time around, you have what we call PPR pipe, which are less affected by what? By uh, corrosive um, chemicals. You have RCC material with sacrificial lining and large pipes. These are how you can control your corrosion in sewage treated plant. Midget. So there's no how you're going to have sewage treatment plant that you won't have midget because these are flies that are being attracted by the odor of the sewage. Midget either call fly lava blood or red worm strife in water treatment plant. The charge of inadequate treatment sewage causes midget. It attracts them. If you don't treat your sewage very well, you see them around every time in large quantity. Then disease spread. The charging of poor or untreated sewage causes a lot of disease. That issue. The sewage discharge pollutes the water, spread disease, destroy attract aquatic life. It's like Then we have serious environmental and health implication. One, pollution of water with toxin, excess nutrients, heavy metal, pathogens. Pathogens end up in swimming pool and drinking water and causes dysentery, hepatitis, diarrhea, respiratory infection, heart disease. And an estimate, an estimate by the Environmental Protection Agency shows that between 1.8 eight and 3.5 million people get sick from contact with sewage from the overflow of sanitary sewage annually. Such illness and disease can be very deadly for children and also affect about 30% of the elderly and other patients with weak immune system. That is why you need to take your sewage treatment plant very, very serious. So that brings us to the end of today's uh, topic. So you have an assessment to do. I don't want any question around this assessment. So you know the normal thing. Let's Please signify by raising up your hand for question, please. Or are we saying there is no any question? Okay. 
Okay, Mr. Atosin, Mr. Uh, Mr. Anthony, I have two people raising hand. So Mr. Atosin will be the first person, Mr. Anthony second. Then who else? Okay, Mr. Atosin, please can I go ahead with your question while we're waiting for that. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Okay, Mr. Tosin. Yes, sir. Uh, my, there are two questions. Okay, sir. Uh, one, one related to uh, for the bottle. Okay. Uh, up until now, uh, after the bottle has been dug, mm. we still, the pumping machine, I mean, the submersible mm. uh, pump still pumps out the uh, sand. Sand. In, uh, How long yes. has the bottle been dug? Ah, uh, it's more than two years now. And it's still pumping it's sand. Three years, yes. Yeah, what could yeah. actually cause that is that, you know, when you do your borehole, yes. there is something that we call screen. Okay. So if the holes of the screen are too wider because the screens are so done in such a way that it is only water that can pass it through. Okay. Sand. So, if the screen is a bit wider than the way it should be, that would be, you might be expressing some little particles of sand. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Then, but the, the sand you are seeing are fine particles. They are not very fine, very soft if you touch it. Yes, very yes. soft. But at a time, we see a very like uh, muddy. Yes, 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 it's possible. The screen is the screen is the screen. Maybe when they did the ball, the screen is white. Is it industrial or um what depth? No, this one is uh, this is not industrial. Okay, it's not industrial. It's possible. It's possible. So what, what is the remedy? What can we do? No, 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 no. As long as the ball is giving the you the normal yield, there's nothing you can do to control it. So what, what we do uh, is we have to pump out the water because uh, you pump it, pump, it, pump it out for like 10, 15 minutes. That before, uh, when it is clear, yes. it beats, then you now turn it over. Yes, so, of course. You, you, allow, you allow it to settle. So that means you have to be cleaning your tank on an interval basis. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, what we even do now is that we just, we connected a pipe, external pipe directly from the bottle. Okay. Um, so when it is clear, Okay. They will not turn it in. We just lock the the valve oh. pass that we need to throw it away for like 10, 15 minutes. Okay. They will not turn it to the tank. You know, at that time it's cleaner. After 15 minutes, it cleaned up. Okay. What cleaner. you're saying is that when you when you pump initially, it's, it's always dirty. Yes, yes. So but when you pump for like when you pump for like five, 10 minutes, it will become very clear. Yes, clear. I think the, it's still the same thing. The screen, the screen that is um, installed within the aquifer, the sand is pulling, is coming in. So when the ball settles down, the screen comes, the sand comes in. As soon as the as soon as the pumping machine starts, the submersible so starts, it starts pumping out the sand. Until when it's pumped the sand and the sand is clear, that is when okay. it now start pumping clear water. Oh, oh. That is what you okay. can do. That is the only thing you can. As long as it's yielding, you don't have nothing to worry about. Okay. Because at times, if you leave your ball for a longer period, maybe for like 10, 15 days, by the time you start pumping, you see some blackish water coming out. Then after like mm -hmm. five, 10 minutes, it becomes very clear. Okay. That is also possible. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Then the second one is about the smell. Okay. That comes out. It's a... Uh, like uh, eight or ten uh, restrooms as a toilet, okay, arranged um, in parallel as in straight. Okay, you know, at times we get the feedback as in odor. Okay, you know that uh, even though there's there's an AC there, mm. you know, but to an extent, it's still the odor still comes in. The 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 urinary. Yes. Your urinary. Okay. The pipe that takes the urine to the drainage <coughs> before it goes to the um, septic tank, does it have a vent? 
I'm not sure it does. That is what you need to confirm. Because it does not, if it does, if it does not have vein, that is what we call backflow of odor. Then, oh. yes, if it doesn't have vent, you can introduce a, a, a harm. Okay. Something that's just that, like a vein, like your normal YouTube. You understand? Okay. Where, where is that going to be? Is it outside? It's going to be, uh, it's going to be within uh, outside at the back of the urinary. You can talk to your plumber. Your plumber can get that done for you now. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. You're trying to introduce, first of all, introduce a vent. Okay. When you introduce a vent, it creates a balance between the, the between the line and the atmosphere, atmospheric pressure. So that should reduce the odor because the, the air condition you are applying may not be able to solve it. Okay. Mm. okay. But you have to look at the cost uh, cost element because the other thing you can do, you can do an, a balance of uh, circulation of air. You can install what we call a, uh, a wall-mounted uh, extractor. What do you call it now? Wall mounted extractor, extractor fan. Okay, wall mounted extractor. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. It, you can store that okay. one within the urinary area. Urinary area. Okay. Yeah, because that the urinary area is uh, is not by the window side. Okay. So see, the only no, thing I would the, 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 the first option I would advise you to try is the vent one because that is cheaper. Cheaper. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's cheaper. You just get the, the matter of getting pipe. That's all. Okay. Okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Anthony. Yeah. Good. Hello, sir. Yeah, Good, evening, sir. Good evening, Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Mr. Anthony. I can hear you. Okay, sir. I want to really thank you for today's lecture. Can you hear me, sir? I can hear you clearly, Mr. Anthony. Can you hear me? I can hear you clearly, sir. Okay, sir. I said I want to really, I want to thank you for today's lecture. You're much welcome. Uh, it's sir. more like an, uh, more, much uh, like an, an eye opener to some of those issues that I've, uh, I've been encountering in uh, my facility, though. Yeah, my first question is, um, um, is it possible for you not to have um, a dosing pump with chlorine, probably with soda ash or lime, and you just only depend on the filter media to filter the water? Is it going to give a quality water at the end of the day? That's not my number one question. Okay. I hope you understand my question, sir. I get your point. I get your point. Yes, sir. Then, now, my number two question is, uh, how long, uh, let's say, a block of flat of 12. Okay. 12 flats. Mm. How long do you need to change the filter media? Mm. Okay. So can I call me, sir? As the filter media, how long do you need to refill it? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. One. All right. Okay. You, sir. you ask if it is possible to do without dosing in your water treatment plant. The like exactly, I sir. when I was teaching, I said something. I said a single water treatment plant, uh, water treatment setup cannot solve all water problems. You can apply the same principle to all water. And that is area where your analysis comes in. You need to analyze your water and know what is the problem of your water. I keep telling people, it is not every water that requires chlorine. And it is not every water that requires soda ash. The problem of the water will tell you what is the exact chemical you need to apply. It is quite possible for you to treat your water without any chemical. It's possible. If your water is almost passing when you do the analysis and all the biological requirements the chemical requirements and physical requirements the water is almost falling within that range and you know that your filtration system can take care of that remaining one there's no need of chemical there is a background noise can that person please unmute himself 
for that simple. Thank you. So, it's possible you can do without chemical, but first of all, I will advise you, sir, try to do the analysis of your water. If you do, if you analyze your water at a NAVDAC approved laboratory, then even if you don't understand it, get somebody who understands how to analyze that result. Let them analyze for you. But if the result suggests you must use chemical, you can't rule it out because what you want is you need water. Then the second thing, if your water, you are only basically using it to wash car, water gardens, you may not need to use chemical. As long as you can take some um, odor and every other thing away. Why not? Why do you need chemical? You may not. But if you need that water for sanitary purpose, washing of hand, washing of WC and every other thing, there might be need for you to yes. use chemical because of bacterial infection. Then if the water is required for drinking, you might not, and you may, you may still use chemical, you might not use chemical. So that's the reason why I said the quality of the water, the result of the analysis will determine what you need to put in place. Then you ask about how often should you change your sand media? I always tell people the effective period for your sand media is one year. Effective period, because those items that you have inside your sand media expires as well. Your activated carbon expire, your resin expire, your <coughs> PEM expire, your uh, uh, calcite expire. All those things, they, they have expire. But to me, to have effective period, one year is okay. But at times, it may extend to 18 months. It all depends on usage. If I have a block of flat of like 20, and I have a block of flat of 15, the water demand in 20 is more is lesser to 20, 15. Likewise, the water demand in 15 is far, far, in five is far, far lesser than 15. So the daily work that that filtration media is doing is different in all those three flats. Mm -hmm. One is 20, one is 15, one is five. Exactly. So somebody that is in five, you can change your media after two years. But if you are running a block of flat of 20, you can't wait on the two years. Because the workload on that media is far, far more compared yeah. to other places. So by the time you are getting to 12 months or 13, 14 months, it might not be as effective as it ought to be. So use it to it. Then that's why it is always advisable to me between 12 to 18 months, you can change. And likewise, let me add to it. There are some areas where we have what we call UV light, ultraviolet light, UV light. In some places, you install the UV light and leave it for donkey years. The effective period of the bulb inside that UV light is nine months. After nine months, it's no longer killing any bacteria. Take it or leave it. It's just only there as a normal bulb. So it is normal. Every nine months, you must replace it. So I hope that answers your question, sir. Thank you very much, sir. You know, no, sir. Welcome, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, Mr. Vianana. Okay, yes, sir. Good evening. Sorry, Good evening, my, my brother. My network is a bit bad, so my hey, screen, I guess, screen is not coming up. <laughs> you know, we is fighting with NCC this time around. <laughs> Okay, all right. So uh, just to share some experience and okay, uh, okay for the question he asked on whether is it necessary to use uh, uh, to treat your water without uh, chemical the use of chemical. Yeah, it's possible. There are filtration systems that can also take a handle uh, the bacteria and the organic organisms. So you do not need to use chlorine, for example. And just like you have said, in the place of chlorine, you could go for uh, uh, ozone treatment. So necessary, you may not necessarily need uh, chemical. Like in our own uh, system for water, particle water treatment, we have 
Even the filters, they have a combination of filter. We start with a, a cation uh, uh, exchange filter. We have an anion exchange filter before it goes into a mixed bed, which contains both anion and cation uh, resin. So by the time the water passes through all this media, it is as good as uh, pure. So you may not necessarily need all those. So like you also said, is is a function of the, the test result. It's a function of the test result. So your test result will determine uh, to what, uh, what type of uh, treatment you will use and what extent of treatment you need to do. Like in our own case, our water, from the depth we are getting the water, it comes with low pH. So why so for some persons, the iron content is a problem. For our own, it is high pH. Then also for coastal environment, like some areas of Lagos in the river state, for, for example, there's what we call salt water intrusion, where when you dig your borehole to certain uh, depth around the coastal area, your water tastes salty. So in this instance, you are de dealing with the uh, water that is hard. So you need to do your treatment to take, uh, get rid of the dissolved minerals that are causing that uh, salty condition. Then uh, just before I, I conclude, I also want to share my experience. In addition to wastewater treatments, you also have uh, other water treatment like your swimming pool systems. Then in my own uh, facility, we do cooling water treatments because we have very large uh, machines that uh, need cooling and we use water to cool them. So in those systems, we initially we use a chlorine in gaseous form, but because of uh, safety issues, we are now using it in, uh, in powder form. So there are those into the systems in the uh, powder form because the in liquid in uh, gaseous form if you have leakage just like we say anything that can kill a microorganism can kill a human and so in that uh, high concentration chlorine can just take you out in less than a minute if the concentration is very high and you are exposed to chlorine it can take you out in less than a minute so because of safety concerns, we, uh, we stopped using uh, chlorine in the uh, gaseous uh, form. We used to come in uh, large uh, cylinders, chlorine uh, canisters. So that's just my contribution. Thank you, Mr. Vianana. Mr. Atosin, I can see you raising your hand again, please. Come on. No, no, sir. It's the other one. OK, 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 OK. Any other question? Okay, so that means in the absence of no question, we can we can call today class a day. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening to me, and I wish you a very great weekend. So thank bye you, bye. Thank, thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Madam Chinyere, Yes, sir. Good evening, ma'am. Where is my Abuja gift? Because I remember the last time we spoke when you just landed up. I, 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 I don't know how to bring it to your side. I kept it in my freezer. Is there cooling for you? I am so serious. It's in your office, right? It's in, my, it's in my house. I put it in my freezer and I'm thinking of when I'm able to get to your side to drop it. So I don't know if, if you can come across uh, Lekki or Ophiari side, we can, we can drop it for you. <laughs> lucky, lucky. I'm coming to us, Lucky, tomorrow. I'm coming around Agungi tomorrow. Oh, no, I, I don't live in Lucky. My office is in Lucky, but I stay around Ogudijiari, so. Ogudijiari. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, anyhow. Let me yeah. see. Let me see what I can do. Maybe I'll pick yeah. your mobile from uh, 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 Barakat. Barakat. Please do, because I kept some fine, crunchy, crunchy kilishi for you. I'm sure your mouth is watering. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, Ada. If I come to, if I come to pick it at home, that means we need to add pandedia. <laughs> I'm able, I have to give you a wine and whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> OK, but I'll pick your mobile from, I'll pick your mobile yes. from uh, Baraka. I'll pick it good. I'll pick it good. I, I will, you will have to I'll, be part I'll, of I'll this, so, madam. Your, uh, <laughs> we will be listening to all this without partaking. You know. 
Why do you say that? No problem. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.